Uh, the title of the sermon is Captivity, Freedom, and Renewal. And if you have your, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you could turn to Luke 4, um, starting in verse 14. Or you can raise your hand. One of the ushers will give you a Bible. And then we're also going to hop to Isaiah 61. Father, let that passion continue, Lord God. That passion of your Holy Spirit for us. Thank you, Lord. We ask you to come. Let me show you guys this big number here on the screen. And you could take a guess what that number represents. But that number, over 1.1 billion, actually represents the number of internet searches on pornography. And when I first saw that number, I thought maybe it represented the number of searches since the beginning of the internet, but it actually represents the number of searches starting from January of 2015. And so for many, pornography is an addiction. And it's this unhealthy, seemingly unstoppable behavior. It has this short-lived pleasure, but it really masks and hides a deeper pain for those that are caught in its trap. And I know because from 1985 to 1995, I was one of those addicts starting from elementary school. And for many, pornography is really just one of a list of these secret and dark sins. And you might be able to identify uh, with that struggle. And so even though I'm just primarily going to be talking about pornography and sexual sin, this message can be applied to other addictions as well, whether it be uh, chain smoking, substance abuse, overeating, frequent overspending, or for some there's this unhealthy emotional addiction to romance novels, or there's this frequent or uncontrollable anger, and all of this can, can affect both men and also women. And the Bible talks about this kind of behavior when Paul in Romans 7 was talking about this kind of behavior where he said, he said, even the very thing I don't want to do, I wind up doing. And he was describing the behavior of this person caught in sin. The very thing I choose not to do, I wind up doing. And then he said, who can, who can rescue me from this body of death, he says. And in essence, he was saying, who can, who can rescue me from me, is what he was asking. Who can rescue me from me? And the beautiful thing after that is he actually begins to answer his question. And he said, who can rescue me from this body of death? death? He says, thanks be to God. He says, Jesus Christ delivers me. And he says, Jesus Christ frees me. And if you're one here who is caught, trapped, held captive by pornographic addiction or any other sex addiction or any other addiction for that matter, I have very, very very good news for you. Jesus Christ wants to set you free. And if you so desire, Jesus Christ will set you free. And it gets even better because if you've already experienced this kind of freedom, he won't let that freedom stop there. He will actually expand this freedom so others experience the freedom that you yourself have experienced. And, you know, when I was preparing for this, I actually, um, you know, I was praying to God and I asked God, God, uh, I just sense maybe it's time to share this in a, in a bigger setting. And then I said, Jesus, are you, I said, Jesus, would you set people free that Sunday that I preach? And I felt like he said yes. And then I didn't know if that was just me kind of like speaking the words of God or putting words in his mouth. And so I said again, I said, Jesus, really, are you going to set people free that Sunday? And then I felt he said, my yes is yes. And then I felt like he was even saying, even before Sunday, I'm going to start setting people free. And so I got really excited about that. And just in this past week and a half, there are these, these divinely orchestrated meetings and the first, the first one out of those three was particularly special because I didn't, I didn't even know I was going to meet this person. We wind up meeting just by happenstance 
in New Jersey, and we weren't even planning on it, and we wound up staying at the same place in New Jersey, and I just felt God was telling me to bring this up with him about pornography, and we had never spoken about this before, and he, I begin to ask him, and then he begins to confess all these secret sins. And on one hand, I, I, I felt his pain, but on the other, I just sensed that God was so, was so faithful and good and true by saying that even before Sunday, he was going to start setting people free. And so he is here today. He is going to continue that work in setting people free. Let me pray for us. Father, I invite you to come, Lord God. Father, your Holy Spirit, who's begun a work already, I ask that he continues his work for freedom. And we say, come, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you look, um, if you look to Luke chapter 4, we'll start in verse 18. It says, it reads, this is the first public address of Jesus Christ, his first public speech. And so it's a significant one. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so the first question I know I ask myself when I look at this, it was his first public address, and so it was a significant one. So the first question is, why did he have to preach this in the first place? Why did he come out with this? And it's right there in the middle of verse 18 where he said, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And so the spiritual condition of the people of God is that they were enslaved to sin. They were spiritual prisoners, and that's why he had to proclaim this. If you recall in John chapter 8, Jesus says, he said, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Those were the words of Jesus. And so because of his passionate love for us, he said, I'm not going to sit idly by while that takes place because he knows that every single person made in the image of God is meant to be free. And so that's why he proclaims this message. He proclaims freedom. And the wonderful thing about this is that he actually gives a timeline on when this is to take place. He proclaims freedom, and then he gives a timeline when he says, he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And it's like he was saying, today, freedom is proclaimed, and freedom breaks out. He says, today, slaves to sin will no longer experience slavery. They will now experience freedom. And it's almost like he was saying, listen up, open up your ears because the sound that you will hear are the sound of shackles falling. And if you read through the rest of Luke, he, he does exactly that. He makes a proclamation and then he goes out and begins to set people free. The good news is that the Jesus that was setting people free back then is here setting people free today. Today. Thank you, God. And so how does this happen for me? In my experience, when I've shared my testimony, and you guys can identify with me, when you share your testimony of how God has worked, his power begins to move. And so when I've shared my testimony, people get set free. Or they move toward freedom. And it's like, when you again, when you share your testimony, it's like there's this light that begins to shine in the dark places of our hearts, and he begins to illuminate the place, and he begins to set people free. Because he's good. There was a New Life leader. I was talking to him about this content, and he said, he began to tell a story about his dad, a chain smoker, and how he, he, he heard a message like this, and even during the sermon, he couldn't stay in his seat. He couldn't stay in the room. He had to get out the room. He went to the bathroom. He started coughing. And after that, he did not pick up a single cigarette again. Jesus Christ sets people free. And he is here today. 
He started already even before, before today, and he will continue to do his work. And I sense that just as I begin to share this, that you will sense even the Spirit of God working in you. So when I was 10 years old, uh, I came across a stack of pornographic magazines uh, in my home. What first started off was just curiosity. It turned into this pleasure. And I went through each one of those magazines. And I even got my little brother into it, who was at that point eight years old. And after that, I moved on to, the, to, to videos, also videos that I saw in my home. And I went through each one of those videos, and I recall the excitement that I would have whenever my parents told me they were leaving the house and I was going to be home alone because I was going to go through those videos. And then in school, I would begin to fantasize about these videos. And then I would place in the girls of the school into those videos as I began to fantasize. And I even began to fantasize about teachers in the school. And there was one thing I noticed about my behavior. I didn't, I didn't want to stop, but when I tried to stop, I couldn't. And it's just a telltale sign of addiction. You want to stop, but you can't. The very thing you don't want to do, you wind up doing. And then God began to make himself known. When I was 15 years old, I heard the gospel from a friend of mine. This person presented the gospel, and I began to believe this gospel, and I gave my life to Christ. And then I started to read the Bible, which is when the trouble starts, you know. I read the Bible, and then I, I come across this Matthew 5:28, what every addict of porn or sex hates. It's this Matthew 28 verse that says, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And shame began to set in. There was so much guilt because I was a Christian already, and I was still struggling with this. And I believed in the word of God, and it said that I was committing adultery in my heart, and there was a shame and guilt, and I didn't want to tell anybody about what was happening. And even when I got up the courage to confess, I still began and continued this addiction. And what I really hated was my dad had an affair with another woman, and he actually left the family because of this other woman, and so he committed adultery. And so the very thing I was angry at my dad about, I was committing in my heart. And I felt so dirty. I felt so sick. I felt so much shame. And there's so many low points I can think back to. I felt so much guilt. Here I am, I'm a Christian. And yet I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in this. I'm trapped. No freedom in sight. And I would go. I used to enjoy going to the beach. But then now I would go to the beach and it would just be this place of torment. Like I couldn't look away. I couldn't control my lust. I hated it. And then there was this even, there was even this one. And you know, even as I talk now, like I sense the spirit of God tugging on many hearts. And I'm here to tell you, it's okay. God loves you. He's in a love pursuit of you. He sets people free. And there was this one low, even this one low point. I came across this publication and it had soft porn on it. I was looking through it. I knew it was wrong. And then I began to walk away. And just seconds after I walk away, it was like I had to go back. So I went back. I walked away again. And then back and forth I was. It was like three or four times I'm going back to this thing. I felt like there were chains on me. And again, just, to, just I got so sick of myself. But freedom comes in 1995. Praise God. So I was at, I was at this church. Um, I was part of a youth group at a church in Elmhurst, actually. And I began to confess my sin to this couple that I really trusted in. And um, I confessed my sin. Very difficult. But I just knew I was just sick of it. I, I, I wanted out of this prison. And so I confessed it. And they started praying for me. And they said, they confessed sexual sin. And then I said, whoa, wait a second. You know, I don't think I'm that bad. And so I was saying that inside of me. And I said, you know what? I think you should stop that prayer because I don't think that really applies to me. And then I felt like this, this loving voice came. And this voice said, 
you know, and I knew it was from God because it wasn't a condemning kind of voice. And it was like this inviting kind of voice, acknowledge your sin, and you will receive forgiveness. And then there was something I said that was very key. I said, I want to be set free. And even if you sense the Spirit of God working in you now, I invite you to just whisper, your, whisper that to yourself. I want, God, I want to be set free. And I realized this, there was this weight that came off me, but it wasn't, it wasn't like fireworks went off. It was like this gentle, this gentleness about me, and there was this thing that came off, and I realized in hindsight that Jesus of Luke chapter 4 set me free. And the one who set me free is here today to set people free. And in a few moments, how they prayed is how I'm going to pray for us. But I realized even after that day, I, I couldn't, I, I, I didn't know what was happening. But I realized what was happening when, that was the spring of 19, 1995. In the summer of 1995, I felt like God was really tugging, tugging me to this evangelistic project in New Jersey. So I feel a real strong tug to go to this like missions pro project in Jersey. And uh, I then realized that the missions project, this evangelistic project in Jersey was at the beach. And so I said, God, what are you doing to me, Lord? <laughs> it was like the place of my torment was supposed to be the place of my mission field. I said, God, how is that gonna happen? How is that going to happen? So I went fearful. And when I went, before that day, I could, not, I could not fathom a day when I would be free. I was so steep and so stuck in it. I could not fathom a day when I would be free, when I would be controlling my lust, when I could look away. But when I hit that beach, it was amazing. It was amazing. For the first time in my life, I could look away from temptation. For the first time in my life, I tasted, I tasted this freedom. For the first time in my life, lust was in control. And I want to I wanna let you know now, some of you, you came into this place and you couldn't, you couldn't even fathom a day when you would be set free. You're so, it's dark, it's secretive, or you're stuck, but you couldn't even fathom that day. I'm here to tell you, that that freedom is not only possible, it's available to you. It's available to you. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It does not matter how deep you are in sin. It doesn't matter how thick you've gone far away from God. It does not matter. He left the heavens for you. No sin can stand in the way between you and the love of God. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing can stand in the way between you and the love of God that pursues you. Nothing. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to ask us to pray. You know, you don't have to bow your heads right now, but I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And if this doesn't apply to you, you know what you have the privilege of doing? You're going to pray. You're going to pray that the Spirit of God just continues to move and do His freedom work here. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, and then if this applies to you, I'm going to ask you to confess your sin. And you're, not going to, you're just going to whisper it in prayer. You're just going to whisper, and you're going to say, God, I confess that I have sinned by doing this and that, and you'll fill in the blanks. And then I'm going to ask you to do something courageous. I'm going to ask you, while the heads are bowed, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. I'm going to ask you to then put down your hand, and then I'm going to pray a prayer of forgiveness that you will receive that is available here today. After that, you're going to rededicate your body. You're going to rededicate every single part of your body that was used for sin, both private and public parts. Your eyes, your hands, your lips, whatever it is, you're going to name that part, and you're going to say, God, I dedicate my eyes, my hands, whatever it is, you fill in the blank unto you, because your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And then after you do that, I'm just going to pray a prayer of freedom. 
and then ask God to fill you. So I invite you to bow your heads. If this doesn't apply to you, you can whisper in prayer that God begins to move. Actually, he's already moving, that God just doubles the move, triple the move that he's already at work in doing. You say, come. And so begin to confess. Just whisper in prayer, I confess, Lord God, that I have sinned by doing this, that, and you just fill in the blanks, and you name it. Go ahead and do that at this moment. Again, if this doesn't apply to you, continue to pray and whisper in prayer for those around you. And so if this is you, if you want freedom, forgiveness, while heads are bowed, I invite you to raise your hand as a sign of that confession. You can put those hands down. In 1 John 1, 9, it says that if you confess your sins, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so based on that raised hand, based on that confession, receive the forgiveness that comes from the Father who loves you. Receive the forgiveness that comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Receive his forgiveness. And so I invite you to take a deep breath, take an inhale in as a sign of you receiving this forgiveness that comes from God. Oh, that feels good, Lord. Thank you. And now I invite you, rededicate each and every part, both public and private, unto him. Name those parts. Father, I dedicate my eyes to you my hands to you, my genitals to you, Lord God, my thinking to you, Lord God. Name these and rededicate them unto the God who gave them to you because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and do that now. Thank you, Lord. And then just whisper, if this applies to you, just say, I want to be free, Lord. I want to be free. And so let me just proclaim this over you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Almighty, I proclaim freedom for captives now. I proclaim release from darkness for prisoners now. And I say, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come, Lord, do what you do best, do what you came to do. And now I ask, Father, fill these hearts, Lord. Fill these hearts, Lord God. Fill these hearts to overflowing. Fill these hearts with your spirit. I just see your hearts getting filled with the spirit of God. Father, I speak an overflow in their hearts, Lord God. The spirit of freedom come, Lord God. Let it overflow, Lord, that they will come out of this room changed, God. Come. And it's in Jesus' name that we say, amen. Amen. Woo! That was good. And so if you, felt, if you felt a change, let your small group leader know. If you, if you see a change this week, let me know. Let a leader know. We want to we wanna see what's happening. Share, share your testimony. And so, listen, we're not, we're not done. The story gets even better. In Luke, Luke 4, he's actually, he's actually quoting Isaiah 61. He's quoting Isaiah 61. And in Isaiah 61 was this prophetic word spoken about Jesus. And so he begins to read it. And so here's Isaiah 61. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me 
because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for prisoners. And then he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then if you go to Isaiah 61, there's a verse, there's a verse that comes and it says to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. And if you look in, cha if you look in chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus Christ left this verse out. And I don't know why, but when I first read this, I, th I thought that the reason why he left it off is because that vengeance of God was against me. That vengeance of God was against me because of the, the filth of my sin. And if you feel that way, if you feel like the, the vengeance of God is upon you, his anger is upon you because of your sin, I'm here to tell you that is a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And the reason why is because Jesus, his grace covers sinners. His grace and his love covers sinners, not his vengeance. And so when it comes to this passage, I ask, what's the vengeance against? And that vengeance is against darkness. That vengeance of God is against the darkness that brings captivity. It's the vengeance of God against imprisonment. It's the vengeance of God that has robbed so many of us of our innocence, that has robbed us of family. That's what the vengeance of God is about. In other words, God has got your back. His love protects you, and his vengeance goes against darkness. And a really great picture of how this vengeance of God against darkness connects to freedom is just if you recall how God, through Moses, set the Israelites free. And so what he does is the, the Israelites were in captivity, Moses comes and he says, let my people go. And then the vengeance of God pounds on the oppressors. He pounds on the oppressors with plague after plague after plague. And if that's not enough, he buries it under the sea as the people of God move toward freedom. And so how does this apply to you? Just like the Israelites who are oppressed, his love protects you. And you have been enslaved by sin, but the vengeance of God against darkness also brings you freedom. And how is this, how is this released? And it's a, simple, it's a simple prayer. You don't have to bow your heads, but you can close your eyes with me as I pray through this. Just the vengeance of God against darkness for you and for your freedom. And so you can close your eyes with me, and I say that by the authority given to me and given to the team of people who are praying at this moment, I address that darkness, and I say, the vengeance of God pound on you, darkness, in Jesus' name. And I say, let my people go, in Jesus' name. And let freedom reign in this place now. And let your light continue to shine. Thank you for freedom. And again, another beautiful part about this is that the work, the work of God doesn't end in individual freedom. You think you're, God sets you free and that's it? It actually gets better than that. So when he sets you free, he moves you to, he expands that freedom toward what I'll call this community renewal. And here's what I mean. If we go back to uh, Isaiah 61, so that first part about that is about the proclamation of this freedom to captives, those who are opp oppressed. And then if you scroll down to verse 4, it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And then the question I had was, who, who are they? Who are they? Who are they because this is not just about the renewal of buildings when it says renewed cities. This is about the renewal of people. If you go back and you read through Isaiah 61 after verse 4, it's the renewal of people that's taking place. And so the question I had was, who are they? They are the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners. 
The captives, the prisoners, they rebuild, they restore, they renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. They're the ones that bring community renewal. In other words, God flips the script. In terms of ruined cities that have been devastated for generations, you know that it's not only your sin, but it's your mom's sin or your father's sin, and it goes back generations. It stops with you. Watch him flip the script. It stops with you. And this renewal begins with you. So he sets people free. He shows vengeance against darkness. And then he uses the least likely, these freed prisoners, to begin this renewal of communities. So picture addicts freeing other addicts. Imagine junkies setting other junkies free. How cool is that? And for me, this is how it played out. In the spring of 1995, I get set free. And then in summer of 1995, I move into this beach summer project. I'm, I'm enjoying this freedom. So as I'm sharing about my faith, I begin to talk about this newfound freedom as well. And when I begin to share about this newfound freedom that I had just received, a few months earlier, I felt like something strange was happening because one by one, there would be these guys that would go up to me. And then they would just tell me about these sins, these secret sins, these activities. Now, recall, this is the first time I'm talking about this. So it's like all these guys, these guys were like sharing with me their junk, you know. So I was like, listen, why are you telling me this junk? You're actually worse off than I am, so keep your junk to yourself. You know, I was like, what is happening here? Why are you guys telling me this? But I had realized, as I was sharing this testimony, God was setting people free. And I began to see it. And so as I began to share, there was this, like, small community of renewed people that started get, to get together. This was in 1995. I actually had to go back to my journal just because I wanted to see what it was like. And so in my journals of 1995, I looked, up, I looked it up, and I took a photo and these were these guys. Their names were in there. This is Brian, Ru Ruben, Israel, Alex, Dave. These were the guys that went up to me. And then I put down, they are free. And the spirit of the living God is here setting people free. And so what I realized when this was happening, it wasn't a, just about personal freedom. It goes so much bigger and better than that. It goes beyond it toward this community renewal. And what I realized is that freed people free people. Freed people free people. And I want to say again that if you're that person and you came in here and you couldn't even fathom that day of freedom, you couldn't even fathom that day when one day you would be free, lust would be in control, whatever it was, you couldn't even fathom that day, I'm here to tell you that freedom is not only possible, it's available for you. And not only is it available, if you desire it, it is yours. It's yours. It is yours. It is yours as a follower of Christ. And so that place of your previous captivity will be the place of your victory out of which this testimony from you will arise as you begin to set others free. This is yours. As you continue to follow him and as God continues to pursue you in his love. Why don't you stand up with me? Let's have the worship team come up. Everybody take a deep breath in. Receive the freedom that comes from God. I want to let you know that a message like this is only, it's only a part of this beautiful freedom journey of yours. It's only a part. Because as you grow in your freedom, you will need community. And so what we offer to you is that there are groups for both men and women 
that are taking place already. There's a Genesis Process group, a Pure Desire group. You can email that email, genesisprocess at newlifefellowship.org if you want more information, either for yourself or for a friend of yours. And then also, some folks will be available in the shell room if you want to gather more information, either for yourself or for someone else. Since 1995, I've had relapses. And it was because of these groups that allowed me to grow in freedom. Come out of the darkness, join these groups, and in free, experience the freedom that God has for you and the community renewal that God has for you. So let me pray and then we'll end in song. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the freedom in this place. Thank you, Lord God, for the freedom that you've begun here. And we ask, Lord God, that you continue to move powerfully in our hearts as we sing unto you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. I want to say something again, okay? I was set free in 1995, but I've had a lot of relapses. I want to let you know, like that's, we just, I just have a lot of junk and we all have just a lot of junk. But there's one thought, maybe two thoughts, two thoughts that really helped me get over that. The first is that you may take one step back, but you'll take two steps forward because victory has already been destined for you. It's already been decided. The second, the second thought, the second thought is, I used to think that I needed to be clean before I stepped into the shower. You don't need to be clean before you step into the shower. Step into the shower, we all have our junk. It's okay. Listen, I'm your leader and I'm telling you now, I've had a lot of relapses, okay? Like it's okay. We have victory. It's already been destined for us. And God loves you, he's covered my sin. So listen, there are two showers here. One is a communion table to my left. You come through the center aisle unless an usher directs you otherwise. Come, experience the freedom by receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The other is I'll invite the prayer team to come up here. I've gone to these kinds of prayers multiple times. It's refreshing. You go and confess. Go. They'll be here, especially if the Spirit of God is tugging on you, you go. And then again downstairs, either for you or for someone else, go to the shell room and speak to one of the people there. Freedom is yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord God, for your grace upon us. Thank you, Lord God, that freedom never runs out. Freedom never runs out. Forgiveness never runs out. Victory never runs out. Never. And so, God, bless you. May his face shine upon you. And may he fill you and flood you with peace and freedom. And so go in the power, the anointing, the freedom of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's free people said, Amen.